When we hear about climate change, images of melting ice and stranded polar bears immediately come to mind. But what is really happening in the Arctic? And why does it matter? In this video, we aim to investigate Arctic resource management and its impact on indigenous people. Currently, the Arctic is warming at a rate nearly twice the global average, with the average temperature having increased 2.3 degrees Celsius since the 1970s. As a result, sea ice is melting faster than ever before, jeopardizing the habitat and food sources of Arctic wildlife. To the governments of Arctic countries, however, the melting ice represents new economic opportunity. As sea ice melts, this place that has been nearly impenetrable to globalization and development is quickly becoming more accessible. The Arctic region is estimated to hold 30% of the world's undiscovered natural gas and 13% of its oil. This, along with newly available shipping routes that would significantly cut the cost and travel time of international freight ships, presents significant opportunity for profit. The difficulty is that nobody owns the Arctic. The region finds itself in the midst of a struggle of competing and overlapping claims over territory and resources. This is incredibly dangerous. Not only will the exploitative decisions surrounding the Arctic affect the region's biodiversity, but they will and do profoundly affect the indigenous peoples who have lived there for hundreds of years. Indigenous peoples are estimated to make up about 10% of the Arctic population. They are part of 40 ethnic groups, foremost among them the Sami in circumpolar areas of Finland, Sweden, Norway, and northwest Russia, the Nenets, Kanti, Evenk, and Chukchi in Russia, the Aleut, Yupik, and Inuit in Alaska, Canada, and Greenland. Indigenous people make up a minority of the population and are likely to be the most negatively affected by extractive practices. Living close to the land, indigenous people's livelihoods depend on the health of the Arctic ecosystem. And yet, indigenous people are hardly given any voice in Arctic governance. Now that we understand how the Arctic is quickly changing, it's important to ask how the territory is governed. Arctic governance is characterized by fragmentation. Arctic states have joined conventions on the environment and territorial claims. One of these treaties is the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, otherwise known as UNCLOS. Under UNCLOS, states bordering the ocean have an Exclusive Economic Zone, or EEZ, that extends 200 miles from their borders. Should a country's continental shelf extend farther than 200 miles, it may use mineral resources beyond its EEZ if a committee finds those claims are valid. States have sovereignty over the resources within their EEZs. This authority means that countries can transport, ship, and drill within that border. With the exception of the United States, all Arctic countries have signed UNCLOS. What UNCLOS lacks is a provision about indigenous people and their territorial waters, putting them at risk due to dangerous extractive activities close to home. An international forum, the Arctic Council, is also responsible for governance, development, and environmental protection of this territory. Of all Arctic institutions, this is the strongest. The Arctic Council has three types of members, states, working groups, and permanent participant NGOs. States have by far the most power. They vote and make final decisions. Supporting the states are working groups, primarily composed of researchers and government agencies. These groups generally exclude indigenous people from some of the important decisions and rely on Western scientific evidence over traditional beliefs and practices. Indigenous people are represented through permanent participants. There are six permanent participant NGOs, which in total represent thousands of people from dozens of indigenous nations. It is important to note that permanent participants do not have voting rights. They may only consult with member states, limiting meaningful indigenous participation. What are the reasons for indigenous exclusion? We sat down with Assistant Professor of Environmental Studies at Middlebury College, Dan Suarez, to discuss why indigenous voices are often silenced. The exceptional threat that indigenous folks pose, right? I talked about the legitimation threat in general to the state, Indigenous sovereignty is threatening and just there has been a drive to eliminate that in whatever means possible. Obviously, like the whole period of colonization involved just dispossession, expropriation and taking. Right now, right, just this trillion dollar development agenda is just coming into direct collision with sort of where Indigenous folks are, their territorial claims. In addition to these structural barriers of colonial legacy, 
Indigenous people also face the material barriers to simply attending meetings and conventions, such as obtaining funding, visas, and travel documentation. Limited language translation and scientific and bureaucratic jargon also add a layer of inaccessibility. These technical barriers are exacerbated by tokenization and the differing value systems between traditional policymakers and Indigenous people. Alaskan Indigenous activist Austin Amasuk describes his community's understanding of their physical landscape as something spiritual and relational, yet representatives of states typically see land and water as economic resources. The current structure of Arctic GEG exacerbates this exclusion. Because of fragmentation, Indigenous people must stretch their human and monetary resources to participate meaningfully in the multitude of confusing and diverse international forums and organizations involved in Arctic management. As exploiting the Arctic becomes more appealing, more participants compete for attention in this multitude of forums, and it becomes more difficult to make Indigenous voices heard. Current mechanisms of GEG also threaten Indigenous people by endangering their land. As institutions such as UNCLOS emphasize territorial claims, there is a focus on carving the Arctic up for resources. For example, as climate change makes oil reserves more accessible, two new fracking projects along the Arctic Circle in the Satu region in northern Canada threaten the indigenous Diné people. Fracking can pollute groundwater and rivers that they depend on, trigger gas releases, and endanger vulnerable ecosystems. While local indigenous leaders of the Yukon and Northwest Territories call for a moratorium on fracking in fear of the health and safety of their people, energy exploration continues to accelerate. So how can we improve Arctic governance? Indigenous people place a high value on self-determination. Some scholars have proposed strengthening the Arctic Council as a centralized regional institution equipped to tackle all Arctic issues. Indigenous peoples, especially the Inuit Circumpolar Council, have argued that a centralized Arctic regional organization would help them effectively articulate their concerns. By alleviating the burden of spreading resources over many regimes, a centralized body would reduce barriers to participation for indigenous people. However, strengthening the Arctic Council must rely on indigenous participation in all aspects of the goal setting and policy making processes. Although Indigenous people claim status in the Arctic Council, their legitimate participation in norm building, goal setting, and implementation must be secured. Furthermore, the strengthened Arctic Council should seek recommendations from an independent group of Indigenous people. By taking place in a forum designed by Indigenous people, this platform could enable meaningful participation in a format that effectively aligns with Indigenous customs and values. Professor Suarez elaborated on the importance of indigenous solidarity. So you asked sort of what are some mechanisms that might get exactly. sort of indigenous folks uh, some plausible ways that they could be included or participate. I think one of the premier ones I can think of would be their threat to that trillion dollar development drive. Partly, like I think there's like a density of folks who are right in the path of these things happening, who are in a position to find common cause with other people who also live there and are also directly threatened by these things. This is an important step because Indigenous peoples are not only practically excluded from Arctic governance, their worldview is also excluded. Even with legitimate seats on the Arctic Council, Indigenous folks are asked ask to participate in a system of governance that is completely abstracted from their experience of respecting the land as a breathing entity, alive in its own right. The general global framework of environmental governance is built into a system that sees the earth as exploitable property, and hence the processes by which governance is acted out inherently exclude those who would work to uphold and deepen a reciprocal relationship with their living environments. As we have shown, Indigenous peoples are currently deeply marginalized and drastically affected by environmental governance in the Arctic. To be effective and sustainable, Arctic governance must not only include, but center Indigenous voices and values. Only if we can come to think of the Arctic as a living, rapidly transforming ecosystem that supports and must continue to support those who live there, as the local Indigenous peoples do, can we move forward in a way that opposes climate tragedy and exploitation and encourages cultural change.